I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. Coming up in today's newscast, a scathing report is released on the 2014 war in Gaza. Nine buildings are dismantled in an Israeli settlement, and we hope you love your name because according to an Israeli study, it may have an effect on how you look. Stay tuned for the latest news in Israel. Just minutes ago, a settler shot dead a Palestinian terrorist armed with two knives. The attack took place in the settler's living room in the Chavat Mol settlement in the South Hebron area. The Israeli victim who shot his attacker dead was treated for light injuries, Magen David Adom paramedics. A blistering report on the 2014 Gaza war has just been released, and it's calling out both Israeli military and political leaders for failing to adequately prepare for the threat of tunnel attacks from Hamas. Israel's state comptroller released the scathing report last night, revealing shocking gaps in the military's intelligence during the time leading up to the war and a failure to create clear operational plans for how to destroy underground Hamas terror tunnels. The Israeli prime minister, among several other defense and intelligence chiefs, is being scorched for failing to make the Israeli security cabinet aware of the subterranean threat, but the leader is fighting back. <laughs> אני מגבה את ראשי צה"ל, השב"כ ומערכת הביטחון, ששמרו ושומרים על אזרחי מדינת ישראל. הלוחמים והמפקדים שלנו נלחמו בחירוף נש... נש... נפש, ועם ישראל גאה בהם. The 50-day conflict, known as Operation Protective Edge in Israel, was prompted by the abduction and disappearance of three Israeli teenagers in June of 2014. After the boys went missing, Israeli troops rounded up hundreds of suspected terrorists, most of which were affiliated with Hamas. In response, the Gaza-based terror organization began firing dozens of rockets into southern Israel, and the conflict escalated into a full-blown war. It wasn't until July of 2014 that the Israeli security cabinet approved an operation in Gaza, destroying dozens of underground tunnels, making their way into Israel. Yet the latest report on the conflict accuses Prime Minister Netanyahu of having kept senior ministers in the dark about that very threat prior to the war. The Israeli leader is denying the accusation, providing eight dates in November of 2013 in which the security cabinet met to discuss the risk posed by the tunnels. האחריות הראשונה שלי כראש ממשלה היא כמובן לדאוג לביטחון מדינת ישראל ואזרחיה. כך עשינו במבצע צוק איתן. הקינו את החמאס את המכה הקשה ביותר שהוא ספג בתולדותיו. חיסלנו כאלף מחבלים של החמאס, את בכירי מפקדיו, הפלנו את מגדלי הטרור, פעלנו בעוצמה, באחריות ובתיאום מלא בין הדרג המדיני והצבאי. אף קבינט בתולדות המדינה לא עודכן יותר. וכשנכנסים לקבינט, צריך להשאיר בחוץ את הטלפון הסלולרי, את הפוליטיקה הקטנה או אינטרסים אישיים. 67 Israeli soldiers and six civilians were killed in the Gaza conflict, and over 2,000 Palestinians were reportedly left dead. The families of Israeli soldiers who were killed during the 2014 war are reacting angrily to the new reports and are demanding the Israeli government to take responsibility for their sons' deaths. Today, the bodies of two soldiers are still being held by Hamas. Knesset Speaker Yuli Edelstein is urging lawmakers to, quote, fully adopt the report's conclusions in in order to ensure that the next threat does not turn into another war. During the war, it was discovered that Hamas used an extensive network of tunnels to cross the border and launch attacks inside of Israel. At least one of the tunnels was discovered to have led into kibbutz miles away from the Gaza border. Now, if you take a look at those images of those scary Hamas tunnels, it's clear they're no joke. While the Israeli government seems to be focused on the issues with the last conflict with Gaza, some analysts say that attention should be shifted to what could be the next one. 
Ongoing reaction to the comptroller's report is topping headlines, while Israeli politicians and military leaders try to blame one another for failings in Operation Protective Edge. Some critics say that while everyone in the Jewish state is busy arguing over what should or could have been done three years ago, Hamas is wasting no time preparing for the next battle. Intelligence indicates the Islamist terror group is engaged in around-the-clock efforts to dig even more cross-border tunnels into the Jewish state. Even though the army's bolstering activities to counter the threat, a barrier to block the underground passageways is far from complete. Other deep concerns center on the Israeli defense establishment's improper assessment of Hamas' willingness to wage war back in 2014. Just last night, the terrorist military wing vowed to escalate its response to Israeli retaliation against Palestinian rocket fire, like what happened this past Sunday. Analysts say such statements should be taken very seriously and are calling on Israeli leaders to not miss critical signals ahead of another conflict which could be looming. Israeli police have finally dismantled eight homes and another building in the West Bank settlement of Ofra. ILTV's Aaron Porras has the scoop. Police spent the previous day removing protesters from the properties, resulting in the injury of eight officers. Earlier this morning, as protesters and demonstrators increased in number and barricaded themselves in and on the last remaining structures, police, dressed in light blue sweaters, attempted to reason with them to leave peacefully, as seen in police video. The eight families living there had already moved out, seeking to avoid confrontation. Police pleas fell on mostly deaf ears, though, forcing the police removal of many of the activists. According to police, quote, hundreds of young men and women were removed either by peaceful escort or forcefully carried. The buildings slated for demolition were deemed illegal and to be destroyed in February of 2015, which is why they're not protected either by the recently passed regulation bill. But protesters have consistently prevented their removal until today. Several more officers were injured lightly in the clashes and are being treated for their wounds. The right wing of Israel's governing coalition wouldn't dare try to bring down the Netanyahu government. At least that's a view of Jerusalem Post International Edition editor Liat Collins, who told ILTV's Steve Leibowitz that the idea of focusing on a regional peace deal is intriguing for a number of reasons. I think his coalition is fairly strong because I don't think people want a, a new elections and the government itself. Certainly on the right, what reason would they have? Um, to bring the government down over something like this. He now. may back off from building a new settlement in Amo for Amona. He, he might, but then he might do some kind, something else to compensate for it in, in, with more housing starts in Gush Etzion or Malad Dumim or an area that's in, in consensus, which I think he probably will do. I think he probably will start uh, sticking more to the settlement blocks. I mean, that's another of those... Donald Trump uh, enigmas with what did slow it down a bit mean? You know, what <laughs> such an imprecise language. Um, so I think he's probably going to. I, I think Netanyahu has a, a clearer idea in his mind of where he wants this to go than we actually know of. I mean, people say he has to come out with uh, and state his policy. And I also think he should uh, make it clearer what what his uh, ideas are. Well, one... But, but I think he has those ideas. One thing that did come out from that meeting is that apparently there's been some behind-the-scenes talks and even some behind-the-scenes meetings dealing with the, the idea of a regional peace, bringing in the Saudis, bringing in the Jordanians and the Egyptians, and apparently there was some secret meeting that took place back in a few months back. Um, is that a, a real thing or a non-starter. I mean, could you see, for example, Donald Trump inviting the leaders of all of those countries that we mentioned and the Palestinian Authority to Camp David and making a deal? I don't think this, those things are going to work under pressure. Personally, and this is, again, it's a personal opinion, I don't see a, a solution to the, the Palestinian issue without uh, Jordan being involved, for example. So, Saudi Arabia probably for the money. Uh, and J Jordan is uh, absolutely essential. It's the other side of, of any kind of Palestinian entity, and its its own majority population is, is Palestinian. I don't see that you can have a solution without bringing Jordan uh, uh, aboard on it. So I think that's definitely a possibility that there'll be some kind of uh, summit in, uh, eventually. And I think that's the direction to go, by the way, personally. I think. Uh, 
moving back towards the Madrid kind of solution away from Oslo and having um, the Palestinian entity uh, more as a confederation with, a, with the Jordanian uh, kingdom, I think that's go going to be the way to go. Easily, and especially with the, the, uh, the great deal maker uh, uh, or orchestrating the entire arrangement. Liad Collins, thank you so much for being with us at ILTV. Thank you for having me. Jewish groups are welcoming news that a municipal executive board is pushing The Hague to offer over $2 million in restitution for money that was wrongfully collected from Holocaust survivors. In the 1940s, many Jews were forced to pay supposed property taxes while they were interned in Nazi death camps. Some of the Jewish residents were even slapped with heavy late fees since they were unable to make payments while being imprisoned or because they were in hiding from the occupying German army. Now the board says that the money was demanded immorally and wants $2.75 million to be returned to the Holocaust survivors or their descendants. The Dutch city of Amsterdam actually made the same gesture last year. In fact, $11 million of property taxes assigned during 1940 to 1945 was given back to Jewish individuals and organizations. Tragically, an estimated 75% of the 140,000 Jews living in the Netherlands before the Second World War were murdered by the Nazis and their local collaborators. The Jewish community of The Hague has released a hopeful statement encouraging the municipality to honor the recommendation and is expressing appreciation for the attempt to heal old wounds, even though it comes too late for most survivors. All right, when a doctor gives you a prescription, one of the first things they say is to make sure to take it all, even if you start feeling better. Now, when one of our senses, like our eyesight, is on the line, taking our medicine correctly becomes all the more important. That's where the Israeli company Eximor comes in. Joining us today is Dr. Daphne Langford, Eximor's chairwoman. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, thank you for uh, inviting me. All right, so what does Eximor do? Tell us a little bit about the product well, that you guys have Ex created. Eximor is developing a miniature a small device that can release drugs for at least six months. So by using this kind of a device, we can avoid using a daily basis eye drops, for instance. And that's specifically for glaucoma, right? Can you tell us about what that is? Okay, so glaucoma is the number one leading cause for blindness worldwide. And 2% uh, of patients uh, above the age of 40 uh, will develop glaucoma. Uh, and it's a sight treatment mm. condition. And actually, it's considered to be the silent killer of sight. And in 2020, approximately 80 million people worldwide will lose, the, will lose their sight due to glaucoma. So we are talking about a major sight threatening condition, but it's a preventable disease. So we can prevent the, the sight loss uh, by using medication to lower the intraocular pressure, which is an elevation of the eye pressure uh, within the eye. Now, the drugs for glaucoma are helping to reduce the pressure within the eye by reducing the amount of the fluid within the eye that produced within the eye on the one option. On the other option, the other drugs will increase the outflow of the fluid out of the eyes. Now, the problem is the compliance patient unnecessarily, most of them won't use the drugs on a daily basis. Sometimes right. they need to take one drug a day, one drop a day. Sometimes they will need to take two drops a day or four drops a day and even two uh, different drops a day in order to maintain lower eye pressure. And here comes Eximo. We are, and we are able to put on a tiny device a, a drug for six months. We put this tiny device in our tear duct and in a very simple procedure in the doctor office and the drugs are being released for six months and we don't have the issue of compliance and we are able to maintain sight for the long period of time. Wow, so can you tell us how you guys came up with the idea for this? What, what was the process behind creating such a tool? So the technology is originated by Shiba Medical Center and uh, we established a company within the VLX incubator in Jerusalem. And uh, the device is combined from a very robust structure that is able to load a huge amount of drug of drug relatively to, his, uh, to its size. Uh, the company uh, accomplished of 
a proof of concept in animal model, in the laboratory settings, and now we even prove that this small device is able to release other drugs, not necessarily only drugs for glaucoma. So that was actually the next question that I want to ask you. I mean, what kind of diseases and illnesses could, could this tool treat in the future? So practically this device can treat, can release drugs for any indication. We are in, at Eximo are uh, focusing in ophthalmology, in eye diseases currently, and we proved that we can release one drug for glaucoma from one device and even two drugs for glaucoma, but also drugs drugs for dry eye, for instance, which is a very uh, disturbing condition, and for uveitis, which is an inflammation of the eye, and other, actually any ophthalmic condition that involves the anterior uh, section of the eye. Wow. All right, so where is this tool available for those who are interested in using it, or is it available yet? Well, we are currently in a development stage. We need to conduct all the safety studies and then to go into human clinical trials according to the regulatory uh, agencies in the US and Europe, etc. And we believe that in a few years we will be available uh, to the market to help maintain a site for patients with glaucoma. Well, it looks like you guys are going to change a lot of lives with this device. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you very much. Now, here's a beautiful story for everyone. A group of Palestinian women in Gaza are working together to help survivors of breast cancer, and many of them have faced the devastating disease themselves. Many of the victims in the impoverished Hamas enclave are unable to afford reconstruction surgery after mastectomies, and some are abandoned and divorced by their husbands as a result. The director of the Aid and Hope program says that at first, in 2008, her center served as just a place for the women to come. Despite a crushing lack of industry in the Strip, now volunteers gather to make undergarments of their own to help create the appearance of the survivors' former figures. The director and most of the women who produce these privately funded mastectomy bras are cancer survivors themselves. While similar items can be sold for up to $300, the center gives them to Gaza's women in need at no cost at all. <laughs> انه النساء اليوم لما بيقعدوا يصنعوا ازداء صناعيه هم بيقوموا بشيء بحسوا انهم بينجزوا شيء لحدا ثاني وهذا نوع من التعزيز النفسي حتى يعني في بعض المؤسسات برا اخذت منا احنا ما بنصدر احنا بنمنحه مجانا وما بنبيعه بنمنحه مجانا لانه هذا كان قرار ماخذينه مرات الورشه بيكون حق الاداء والمواد الخام من وحده من الصبايا صاحباتنا اللي عندها كانسر بس وضعها المادي كويس يعني عاده هذا ما له تمويل معين هذا تمويل بيجي ذاتي من اشخاص مؤمنين بالقضيه Another survivor working on the mastectomy pads describes the profound impact the life-threatening disease can have on women. بنيجي هنا احنا بنعمل الاسداء الصناعيه هذه الاسداء الصناعيه مريحه كثير نفسيا للست يعني بقولوا هم بيحكوا عن مرض السرطان الثدي هو ابسط مرض لكن عند الست صعب 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 كثير يعني شيء بارز في صدرها يعني يرتفع صعب هذا اللي احنا بنعمله يعني هو عباره عن الثد الصناعي بنعتبره انه يعني بريح كثير للست One mother of six who was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2008 stressed the critical importance the product can have on restoring a sense of normalcy to the survivors daily lives بسعد الاخرين فيه وسعدت نفسي فيه لانه اي انسان مصاب في هذا احنا بندل على هنا انه يجوا ياخذوا علشان تكمل مظهرها لانه هذا المظهر هو البارز يعني في الست والست ما بتكتملش الا في جسمها لما يكون كامل هذا بعوض Historically, while the territory was under Israeli control between 1967 and 2005, a special division of the Israeli military, known as the Health Department of the Civil Administration, provided quality health care to Gaza's residents. That ended as part of the peace process when Israel withdrew from the territory. Today, the Palestinian Authority is still technically responsible for medical treatment, but there's sadly been a serious deterioration in service since the Islamist Hamas terror group seized control in 2007. Now, here's a strange question for you. Does your name have anything to do with how you look? Well, according to some new Israeli research, it actually does. 
The Hebrew University of Jerusalem has just released an outlandish new study, and it suggests that there's a good chance that others can guess your name based on your appearance. Now, I bet you're wondering how they came to this conclusion. Well, a team of researchers from the university actually showed portrait photographs to groups of people and asked them to choose the correct names of each person from a list of four. After taking a look at the photos, the participants were able to pick the correct name almost 40% of the time. The researchers even discovered that when only shown a hairstyle, people could still beat the odds to correctly guess the same name. I know this sounds fishy, but the study says that the effect still held true even when the researchers controlled for age and ethnicity, meaning something beyond simple socioeconomic clues was happening. The research was carried out in France and Israel, and interestingly, many French speakers were unable to identify Israeli names from faces, insinuating that the connection between the name and face is often cultural. But the bottom line is this, the study implies that people do indeed look like their names, so we hope you like yours. Well, this is mind-blowing. You know, even though a baby's name might be chosen by others, there's still the idea that a person may be treated as if they have the traits associated with their name, which can end up influencing that person's identity and appearance. All right, moving on, it looks like a major Israeli athlete is set to retire. 29-year-old tennis star Shachal Per has just announced that she will be leaving the game after facing chronic issues with her shoulder. ILTV's Aaron Porras has more on the story. Per was once ranked 11th in the world in women's tennis, the highest ranking for any Israeli player in history. The star athlete represented Israel at two Olympic tournaments and won five international competitions. She even reached the quarterfinals of Grand Slam contests in the United States and Australia. Per says she is devastated to be abandoning her career in tennis, but has simply lost her desire for playing the intense game after 13 years in the professional tennis world. Either way, it's clear that she's made her mark in the Israel sports world by honoring the nation internationally for so long. You guys are going to love this. Once a year, residents in southern Israel are treated to nightly displays of what Israelis like to call dancing clouds, but they're actually starling birds that are swooping through the sky. The performances begin every evening at dusk after the feathery visitors feed and rest during the daylight hours. The flocks then gather to soar in swirling patterns across the Israeli horizon. These starlings originate in Eastern Europe but far prefer to spend their winters in the sunny Holy Land. Their synchronized mermations and collective shifting of movements dazzle and delight all those who are lucky enough to behold the annual flyovers. Many families and friends even set up picnic tables and wine coolers just to make sure they don't miss the spectacular nightly shows. All right, I'm going to have to catch the display myself next year. We all appreciate the importance of getting a good night's rest, but not everyone who suffers from sleep disorders is even willing to seek treatment because diagnosis of the problem often requires an overnight stay at a clinic where you're usually hooked up to electrodes. Well, thanks to new Israeli high tech, that's no longer true. At least 22 million Americans suffer from obstructive sleep apnea, but up to 80% of moderate or even severe cases never even get diagnosed. Here's the good news. Now patients won't have to be connected to lab machines to sort out the issue because of a new Israeli app. An Israeli university research lab has just developed audio analysis technology that can be used by smartphones or any other device with ambient microphones. The system is so remarkable that it even works while participants are awake. The technology evaluates both breathing sounds overnight and speech patterns during the day. Clinical trials show the Israeli non-contact sleep tracking system also reliably assesses related disorders like snoring. And because the app is simple to install, it's far less expensive than the old-fashioned sleepover analysis. Best of all, early diagnosis means those who suffer can seek help more quickly so they can look forward to dreamy and peaceful nights. The Hebrew Word of the Day is brought to you by the University of Haifa, Hebrew Summer Ulpan, open to everyone. And now for our Hebrew word of the day. With the rain clouds and the cold weather settling back in, it's easy to just want to stay in bed and sleep the day away. So today's word is lishon, meaning to sleep. Now, I know you've all probably heard that laughter is the best medicine, but my father always told me that lishon is the best medication, since a good night's shena or sleep helps clear the mind. 
You also convert short-term memory into long-term during your Mahzul Shana or sleep cycle. And let's not forget about all those great dreams you can enjoy. Just remember that even though some of us may feel like our lives only tend to fall apart while we're awake, it would still be a shame to sleep our lives away. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight will be partly cloudy with isolated showers and a low of 57 or 14 degrees Celsius. Tomorrow you can expect more scattered rain clouds and an additional drop in temperatures to a high of 67 or 19 degrees Celsius. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.63 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV. Thanks for watching and see you next time.